Cool. Uh, any questions come up while you guys were playing around with it? Samir? Yeah, that's a good question. So you have to get the email thing working up in the first place. Uh, I'll be honest, I haven't done that before either. Um, I don't really know. There's a gem called Mailer, I believe, that you need to configure. In fact, if I think if, let me take a look. Like you can see that there are a couple different references to Mailer in here. Uh, where are all those? I think those are all the config files. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really know. That would make a good mini lesson, actually, is getting those set up. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm afraid. Erica? Sweet, thank you. Did any other questions come up? Any thoughts? Just the standard of 404, not that Yeah, like if I go to, well, this will probably just make me sign up again. Um, oh wait, I think I'm already in here. Robin at r.co, do, 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 do. Okay, there we go. And then if I go to like bagels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mean you use like a less crappy 404 page? Yeah, so uh, was it in this class that we went over 404 pages or we touched on them briefly? So it's the same thing with these. I mean, you just go into wherever that is on here. Yeah, it's in the public folder, public slash 404.html. Uh, and then, oh, sure, I'll just change it. Why not? Uh, I'll change this to Brendan screwed it up. That's going to be my new 404 page. Hit add, hit commit, and it's all Brendan's fault. Hit push Heroku master. And then when that's done, if I go to another 404 page, then it should be placing all the blame on you. Any other questions while it's doing its thing? Say what? Why is it called a 404? That's a really good question. So there are actually a whole bunch of HTTP status codes. Wait, I think it's done. Uh, 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 there we go. Yep, Brandon screwed it up. So, sorry, man. Uh, HTTP status codes. Uh, if you look inside this public folder here, you can see that there's 404, 422, and 500. Um, so, as you could probably guess, there are uh, 500-ish different HTTP codes that all mean different things. Most of them you're never going to see. I would say 404 is the most common. 200 is what you get, well, when you just successfully go to a page, you get a 200. Um, or at least your browser does. That's, that's the code it gets underneath the hood. Um, these are all just different codes that are transmitted with every single HTTP request you make. It's always going to have a code associated with it. Um, so if you've logged into Slack, you know how Slack is those like quotes that sort of show up when you log in? Maybe. Uh, well anyway, one of those is everything will be 200 okay. And that's a reference to the 200 status code. Uh, maybe you've seen a 403 before, which is when you try to access something to which you don't have access. Um, that was crappy applauding, that was like super broken. Uh, you may have seen a 500 before. Um, there are a lot of well, there are a lot of them. Most of them never even get used. My personal favorite is for 18, I'm a teapot. Um, yeah, and that was a status code that was created as an April Fool's joke. Um, but yeah, lots of different ones. 404 is the most common, though. That's a status code for when a page doesn't exist. Other questions? The Say what? The browser. Well, the browser doesn't. The well, the browser might actually. Uh, some browsers have things built in where if you get a 404 page, then it just sort of shows the default 404 page. Um, but in most cases, the server will respond 
to that 404 by sending, for instance, a page like this so that you don't use the browser's crappy default 404 page. Um, so that's what's going on here. It's still sending a status code so the browser sort of knows what's going on and it's sending this as well. It's much more useful for when we get into APIs and you're trying to get stuff from other websites using JavaScript and then you can tell whether or not it works by looking at the status code. If you got the 200, then you know it worked. If you get a 404, then you know that you're using the wrong API path. One of the most valuable things in uh, a Rails app is being able to look at the console. So that's what I got going on over here on my localhost. And just whenever I refresh this page, as we've seen before, this updates. You can also look at the uh, server logs in Heroku just by doing Heroku logs. And when you do that, you get something like this. You get all of this information right here. Uh, this is fine, but it's a little bit different from what we're used to. Um, so we're used to seeing things about like SQL queries and everything in the server logs. And we're not going to see that here. This is a production log. Production logs are a little bit different. If we wanted to change it over, we could install this thing called 12factor. Uh, and that's what we're going to do next. Um, but before we do that, one last thing. If you type in Heroku logs T, the T stands for tail. And what tail means, it's going to keep the file open and it's going to update it as stuff happens on your server. So if I go back to Tuner, there you go. You can see it updating it now. And if any of you guys were to go to Tuner or Robin, then that thing would start scrolling up and it would log that you were trying to access this. So that's kind of handy when you want to see what's going on. This probably isn't something that you would just sit and watch because you're going to start getting a lot of users and then this thing is just going to be flying by. Thank you to whoever is looking at the page. Um, but it's something where if you run into an error, then it's helpful to be able to go back into it and take a look at what's happening. Wow, man, lots of stuff going on here. Uh, to close out of this, you just do control C, and that doesn't actually like cancel or, or close the server. It just stops looking at this server log right there. So that's Heroku logs dash T. Um, but let's install this 12 factor thing. Uh, 12 factor, it does some things that we're not really gonna appreciate a whole lot yet. Uh, but it's a valuable thing to have in there. What I would like you guys to do is go into your gem file and then add this to the very end of your gem file. So I'm going to do that here. Open up the gem file, go to the bottom, and then I'll just paste that thing in there. Notice that this is saying group production do, whereas these say development and test. So what I'm saying right here is I just want this gem to run in production. I could put other gems in here as well, but this is specifying that I only want that particular gem to run in production only, not in development or test or anything else. Now that I've installed a gem, what do I have to do? Or excuse me, now that I put a gem in my gem file, what do I have to do to actually install it? Bundle install, yep. But first I have to quit my localhost server. So I'm going to control C out of that. That's because it, uh, it only loads gems when the server first starts up. So if you add in new gems, you have to restart the server. So that's what I did right there. Yeah, so control C out of Rails and then just do bundle install. And then when you're done with that and you've done bundle install, your gem file.lock should be orange if you're using Atom because you just made a change to it, which is putting in uh, 12 factor, wherever that may be. There it is. This should have been added into it. Yeah? Uh, we yeah, you always want to push your gem file.lock, and that's because. Uh, so gemfile.lock, it specifies what version of each gem was used to create this particular app. So you'll notice in here, every single thing has a version number. That's what these things are. And so whoever downloads it, uh, they can just look through here and get the appropriate version. Whereas if you just put up gemfile, we don't have a 
version of 12 factors specified there. So they may get the wrong one. So yeah, you always want to push up your gem file dot lock. So I'm going to add and commit and push this back up to uh, Heroku. I think when you first install a Heroku app, it says something about like it would be a good idea to install 12 factor. Um, if you look in all of this stuff that it's printing out at you. And it would always be a good idea to install 12 factor. So anytime you put up a Rails app onto Heroku, I would encourage you to include 12 factor inside it. Do, do, do. Okay, cool. And so now if I go back here and do Heroku logs T again, the log should look a little bit different. There, so before we didn't see all this like artist load, user load stuff, and now we do see it. So now we're using the development log. Instead of the production log, 12 factor puts in the development log, which is more verbose. It shows more stuff. It's easier to see what all is going on. So we got that going for us. Uh, if you're wondering why 12 factor is called 12 factor, 12 factor is a, um, it's sort of a like, philosophy of making apps. The 12 factors are things that this philosophy says every app should have, every good app should have, and if you're really interested, they're all detailed here. Um, most of these things, I mean, we, we sort of do all these things, but we don't really talk a whole lot about it. But if you're interested in sort of the theory behind all this stuff, you're welcome to take a look at 12factor.net. Cool. Okay, so that's 12 factor. Let's see, we did logs, we did 12 factor. So far, so good. Uh, and the next thing we're going to do is just go through some common pitfalls with uh, Heroku apps. Before we do that, any questions? Yeah. I think you can have six going. Uh, and you're probably going to run out pretty quickly. So I. Well, let me show you how you delete one. It's at the bottom of this, actually. Well, okay, so this is a little function I put in my Bash profile that deletes all of my Heroku apps. I don't have any that I want to keep, so this just goes through and it destroys each one of them. Um, but if you don't want to destroy all of them, you can destroy one Heroku app by doing Heroku apps destroy. I think that's it. Yep. Heroku apps destroy, then you need to specify the name of your app. So in this case, it's Tuner Robin. So Heroku apps destroy app Tuner Robin. And when I do that, it's going to say something like, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. There, and now it's gone. So if I go back here, it should say there's nothing here anymore. And if you want to see a list of all of the Heroku apps you have, I think you can just do Heroku apps, and it'll give you a list. Here we go. So I've got Sheltered Island 4549. Um, this old one from WDI5 that I, Matt and I worked on. Uh, and then the tuner I made this morning. I'm going to delete that one as well. I don't need that anymore. Apps destroy app uh, tuner Robin Redux. Inner Robin Redux. And there we go. Uh, and again, this function I made, if you just type in HAP, then it just destroys any Heroku apps you have. So this should go through. I don't really know why it says app not found. There we go. Destroyed my sheltered island. I'll do that a couple more times. So there's that if you want it. Other questions? Samir? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, Coinbase, for whom I used to work, this is, if I go and look at it right now, it's actually hosted on Heroku. So this. Ugh. 
usually a pretty good looking site. So it's going really slow. Um, oh, that's because my internet's crapping out. Uh, so this is a Heroku site. And yeah, you can see that I'm just going to Coinbase.com. With the free version of, ah, uh, good question. Probably, I would think. Um, but I'm not sure. I haven't tried it before. Give it a whirl. Other questions? Just to get a fist of five on this, like, how do you guys feel about like deploying an app to Heroku? You know, zero is like, I have no idea what we did in this class, and five is like, yeah, pretty good. Yeah. So to uh, update your database, yeah, so what you're going to do is you're going to generate a new migration file. So that would be with something like Rails G migration and then like add playlists to artists or something. Just pick some name. Shut up. Uh, so you're going to do that, it's going to create a new file, and then you're just going to git add, git commit, uh, and then git push Heroku master. The only difference is you're also going to do a uh, Heroku run rake db migrate. So the only difference is you're just going to do Heroku run rake db migrate. You can do Heroku run rake db migrate as many times as you want. It's never going to hurt anything. Um, but the only time you need to do it is if you add a new migration file to change your database. Mm -hmm. Yep. Other questions? Cool. Seems like you guys are feeling pretty decent. Uh, so let's talk about some of the biggest pitfalls of Heroku because, you know, as easy as it looks, there are always going to be Heroku errors that you guys run into. So the number one pitfall is not including the right gems. So when you do Heroku create, actually I'm going to do it right now and just leave it running in the background. When you do this and you first first push up to Heroku Desolate Plateau, that's poetic, Heroku Master, uh, it should say something about you should really add 12 factor in. So really anytime you push to Heroku, you want to include 12 factor and you also want to make sure PG is included. So PG is what is created when you do, uh, let me go onto my desktop. PG is created when you do Rails new name of your app, and then dash D PostgreSQL. This is something people always forget, is this dash D PostgreSQL. If you forget that, it, it can be fixed, but it's really annoying to have to go in and fix. So I would say this is like the number one thing to remember when you're making your app is to not just do Rails new name of your app, but Rails new name of your app dash D PostgreSQL. You gotta remember that. If you don't do that, what's gonna happen is Rails is gonna use its default database, which is SQLite. And Heroku does not like SQLite. The way SQLite works is it doesn't save your data in some like sort of mystical database somewhere else. It saves everything in a file just like sitting in your folder with the rest of all your other Rails apps. It creates a like .sqlite file sitting right next to your gem file. When you're just on your local host that's fine, but when you're on Heroku that's a problem. Any thoughts as to why that's a problem when it's on Heroku? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And in this case, because SQLite is saved as a regular file, Heroku's going to delete that file. So Heroku's going to reject any Rails apps that are made with SQLite. And so you're going to run into that if you forget this dash D PostgreSQL thing. So you've got to remember that or Heroku's going to reject your database to protect you from having all of your data lost, which would be kind of a shame. Um, and I think if I look over here now, should say something about 12 factors somewhere in here. Of course, now it's not going to. Now that I said something about it. Oh, duh. That's because I included it in my gem file. Yeah. Well, if I hadn't, it would say, hey, Robin, genius, you should include 12 factor. Uh, 12 factor, again, it does some other stuff, but we haven't gotten into that yet uh, for a while. 
so there's that. There's not running broker run rate db migrate. If you start up your app and it just doesn't open, odds are that's the problem. You forgot to do rate db migrate. Uh, can't drop reset your database. That's what we talked about before, and Mohammed, what you just asked about with uh, your migration files. You can't just go back and edit migration files the way you've done so far. Now you have to actually generate new migration files anytime you want to change your database. Uh, let's see. Saving user uploaded data. If you guys took the file uploading class, you'll have an idea of what that's talking about. Basically, just like with SQLite, you don't want your users to upload images and have them stored inside your Rails app directory um, because if they are, then they're just going to get deleted every time you push this stuff up to Heroku. So anything that isn't tracked by Git basically is going to be deleted by Heroku. So if your users upload something and it's anywhere in here, then that's going to get deleted. Uh, let's see, second to last thing is checking in sensitive information into your public repository. So that's a mouthful. What this is really saying is you don't want to do something like, say, in your artist controller, do like email equals new email, oh well, that's JavaScript syntax, whatever, address robert at r.co, password, I'm not going to tell you my password. But you don't want to put sensitive information into your repository like this. For one thing, when you upload it to Heroku, you're sort of relying on Heroku's security, and we don't actually know how secure Heroku is. Heroku is very secure, but still, you don't really want to rely on someone else. Much more problematic is that if you push this up to GitHub, you're putting yourself at the mercy of the hackers who 24-7 are trawling GitHub using the GitHub API looking for people's passwords, API codes, anything else like that. So if you were in the file uploading class, and you probably heard Adam talk about how we've had students get charged $10,000 by Amazon AWS because they basically included the password for their Amazon account inside their repo. It sounds like a stupid thing to do, but when you're working with APIs, it's actually pretty easy. So that's something you need to watch out for. Uh, really, hackers do just like trawl through GitHub repositories, look for sensitive information, and then they'll either like hack into your account and do stuff, or they'll like run a Bitcoin mining program on your server or something, and they'll really spin up your server and cost you a whole lot of money. Um, so don't do that. There are other ways to do that, which we'll talk about a little later on. Samir? Seed data is fine. I mean, well, depending on the seed data. Like if you have something like, I would not go in here and do something like, user.new password is something like that. I would not do that. So I wouldn't seed with users unless it's something you really don't care about. Like if it's something like, you know, username, test, user, password, foo, like whatever. I'm not going to store any sensitive information on there. But I wouldn't make a seed data for myself. Cool. The very last one, uh, is something that happens all the time in WDI, and that's people using a uh, uh, sort of the wrong file structure. So what I mean by that is if you have a file structure that looks like this, so what would that look like? That would look something like, uh, make your my Rails app, remove tuner Rails deployment inside that, Okay, so if your, um, I don't know, I'll open that up too. If your app directory looks something like this, there we go. If it looks like this, then it's not going to deploy to Heroku. So when I say like this, I mean you have your .git folder here, maybe you have a couple other files, and then you have the folder that was created when you did Rails new. Your .git folder has to be in the exact same folder as app, bin, config, all of this stuff, uh, as well as like your gem file and everything else. Your .git folder has to be in the same folder with all the rest of this stuff. If it isn't, 
then it's not going to deploy to Heroku appropriately. You're going to get something like, here, let me see if I can get this way. Screwed stuff up, git push Heroku master. It's going to tell me something about not being able to find a cedar file. Oh, oh, that actually, that actually worked. I'm impressed. Oh, wait, no, there we go. Yeah, maybe. Huh. Well, it didn't work. Not in the way I expected it to not work, but what you're probably going to see is something about, like, no cedar app detected or something weird. So this is really important because everyone always does this, and it drives me bananas. If your uh, folder is structured like this, it's not going to work. Your .git has to be alongside your app, bin, config, gem file, and everything else. Uh, if it is like set up like that, which is an easy thing to do. I mean, you like go onto your desktop, you go into your WDI folder, then you're like, yeah, I'm going to make a new Rails app. You CD into that Rails app, make a folder for it, and then you do Rails new, and that creates a new folder inside that, which isn't what you want. So it's an easy thing to have happen. If that does happen to you, what you need to do is a series of commands that is written down right here. Basically what you're going to do is you're just going to move everything inside this Tuner Rails deployment, everything actually inside your Rails app, you're going to move it up one level. So that would look something like git move, you can just do move, I'll just do move, Tuner Rails deployment star, which is going to get everything, and then dot. It's going to move everything into the current folder. So when I do that, there we go. That's much better, and now this should work appropriately. Um, but don't remember that. Just like go back and check out the instructions here if you run into that situation. So these are the things that our students very frequently run into when trying to deploy. Uh, on this note, you're going to run into deployment trouble, so never ever leave deployment until right before your project is due. In fact, I would encourage you to deploy like pretty much as soon as you've done Rails new. Just try deploying it, just to make sure what happens. Um, because you're going to run into errors, and even if you, you, know, you feel like you, you got it all under control and you understand everything that's going on, you're still going to run into errors. And so you really don't want to be scrambling to get everything up on Heroku at the last minute. So deploy early, deploy often. Just like we tell you to commit early, commit often. Really do deploy your app like as soon as you have anything to deploy, start deploying it to Heroku just so you can iron out errors as you go. Cool. The last thing I'm going to talk about is this thing called the asset pipeline. Uh, when we talk about assets in Rails, we're talking about stuff like, let me close this thing, I don't need to do anymore. Away. We're talking about the stuff in here, in the app slash assets folder. So you can see we've got images, JavaScripts, and style sheets in here. Uh, if you had like custom fonts, you would put them in here. If you had movie clips or audio, you would put them in here, inside assets. The assets folder is where you put things that aren't essential to your HTML, making your app show up in the first place. Uh, and that's pretty much it. It's where you put stuff that isn't essential to making your app show up in the first place, um, which is why JavaScript and style sheets are in there as well. Um, before I just sort of ramble about it, I'd like you guys to, it says 15 minutes, but it doesn't take that long, so I'm going to say 10. 10 minutes to follow these instructions right here. I'm just going to slack out the link to this section. And basically, it's just adding an image to your Rails app seeing what it looks like on localhost, then pushing those changes up to Heroku and seeing what it looks like on Heroku. You can follow the instructions in here. Uh, please use this image tag helper to make the images show up in Rails. So that's going to be something like image tag cat.jpg. It should look something like that. Don't actually do image source equals, don't do it the HTML way, do it the Rails way, or else it's not going to work appropriately. Cool. So uh, you have 10 minutes to do that. As always, feel free to work together or separately. I don't really care. Uh, and we'll check back in in 10 minutes. I will start the timer. Timer, 10 minutes. <laughs>